It's not, is it sharing that? No. Can we see the presentation? Thumbs up? Yep, you're all good. Okay. All right, so uh, a little bit of background <laughs> on the Sea Turtle Conservancy. Uh, we're based uh, in Gainesville, Florida. Obviously nowhere near a beach, right? Um, but we were founded by a professor at the University of Florida, uh, Dr. Archie Carr. And so he was a professor at the university, so we're based here in, in uh, Gainesville, Florida. He primarily was doing work in Costa Rica uh, in terms of work with sea turtles. And he was not only a professor of herpetology, so studying reptiles, amphibians, but he really loved sea turtles. Uh, he wrote this book called The Windward Road. And it was about his journey in search of looking for nesting sea turtles. Uh, and particularly, he was actually looking for Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. Uh, he didn't find any Kemp's Ridleys, but he stumbled across this place called Tortuguero, Costa Rica. And it was, um, it basically was this huge green turtle nesting colony that was being heavily impacted by the Yo. population. There we go. All right. Um, and so he wrote this book about the plight of these turtles, and that book was then the basis of forming an organization. All right, somebody's drawing on my screen. Hey guys, no drawing on the screen. I'm going to shut it off so you can't do it anymore. Um, but please refrain from interfering with the program. Otherwise, I will figure out who it is and I'll have to kick you out. Uh, and so we were founded back in 1959 to support Dr. Carr's work. A uh, real brief, uh, you know, background on sea turtles, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, they are a marine reptile, air breathing. Um, they have a very complex life cycle uh, for reptiles or for most animals in general. There's multiple life stages. They're using different types of habitat. One of the very few species that are using both the marine ecosystem and the beach and coastal ecosystem. Um, they have multiple migrations, so there's multiple points in their life when they're moving from one place to another for various reasons, and we'll talk a bit about those. Uh, being uh, marine reptiles, they still have to lay their eggs on the beaches. Uh, our sandy beaches here in Florida are a perfect example of that, so they're still connected to land. Uh, they face a wide variety of threats, uh, bycatch in fisheries, uh, pollution, um, still harvest, either illegal or legal in some places still. Loss of habitat <clears throat> is an issue for them, and uh, boat strikes are becoming a bigger issue for them as well. Since these are marine animals, it's really difficult to study them uh, in water because you're just not seeing them for the majority of their lifetime. <clears throat> so of the seven different species or types of sea turtles in the world, uh, Florida gets five of those species either uh, three that primarily nest on our beaches and then two others that will occasionally nest. Though the, the Kemp <laughs> is uh, nesting more and more frequently, it seems, every year. Uh, here in the United States, all sea turtles are protected under the Endangered Species Act, so protected from being harmed, harassed, or anything like that. Uh, so uh, we'll be talking about that loggerhead, uh, that top drawing on the slide. So as I mentioned, you know, sea turtles living in the ocean, most of the research being done on sea turtles is done on the nesting beaches. So you have the females coming up. It's really easy to work with them. This is a green turtle in Tortuguero, Costa Rica. And you can do quite a bit. So you can um, monitor the number of individuals. You can take measurements. Uh, you can uh, track how many individuals are coming up and sort of track those individuals over time. And so it's a very easy way to work with them but you're only working with just the females, so just a portion of the population, and only when they come up to nest. So a very common way, especially here in Florida, for sort of monitoring uh, nesting beaches and not having to go out and try to find every turtle are nest surveys. Uh, this, the photo on the left is the Archicar National Wildlife Refuge up near Melbourne Beach. And it's kind of hard to see the tracks, um, but there's a track on the far top right corner that's a loggerhead track 
And so um, probably many of you know that you can go out on the beaches in the mornings and the, there are groups on all the beaches in Florida doing nest surveys, trying to get an idea of how many turtles are nesting in a given season. And we're just getting into our uh, loggerhead nesting season. It started um, you know, about, about a month ago and we're starting to get into the peak of it now. And that bottom right photo, that's from uh, Costa Rica as well, but you can see all those tracks and how easy it is to identify them and you can get a good idea of how many turtles are nesting and um, on a certain beach and you can track that over time. Uh, an example of that, these are the loggerhead nesting numbers from the Arjikar National Wildlife Refuge. It's about a 21 mile stretch of beach. And you can see that the general trend was significantly increasing uh, until you know right around 2000 when we had a decline. That was definitely worrisome. And these sort of mirror, this trend sort of mirrors the whole entire state. Uh, it tends to reflect the entire state numbers. But you can see that lately there's been a, an overall increase again. And that's the thing about sea turtles is there are cycles, you know, there, there are ups and downs and that's uh, part of the natural cycle of things. Um, but it's pretty impressive to think that, you know, there were close to 22,000 nests um, in uh, 1998. And we're starting to get back to you know, close to a year of that as well in 2015. Uh, there are also in-water surveys. So, you know, I was talking about we're just focusing on those adult females on the nesting beaches. There are projects that will go out and catch turtles in water and try to study them as well. Uh, it gives us a, some additional information on that younger life stage. They tend to be juveniles or sub-adults. But anytime we're working with the sea turtle, we want to be able to identify that turtle over time in case we see her again or uh, him again. And so we use tags. Uh, top left, uh, the one being held is a flipper tag. It's a metal band a tag that goes through the, um, one of the scales of the flippers, front flippers generally, or rear flippers for leatherbacks. And then the bottom, it's a little difficult to see. There's this little piece and that's called a pit tag. And this bottom here is, and so those get actually injected just under the skin. And it's like uh, microchipping your dog or cat, right? And you microchip a pet, it's that same idea that you can scan for it and it gives you an ID number when you scan it. Those tend to last longer. The flipper tags do come out over time. And so if they're pit tagged as well, you can um, easily be able to record that and follow that individual over time. Uh, to give you an idea of sort of the usefulness, some of the first uh, migration <laughs> that we got um, for sea turtles was through these flipper tag returns. So this is an old flipper tag from Costa Rica. And we get an idea of sort of where the turtles are going based on where the tags are found. So often uh, the turtle might strand dead or even alive and be, uh, or show up somewhere else and they can use that ID tag to identify where it came from originally. And so this is a map from, from Costa Rica and all those endpoints are places where we have recovered tags from the turtles we've tagged in Tortuguero, Costa Rica, just to give you an idea. So this was the first sort of trying to figure out how, where turtles went um, so we had a starting point and an end point, but we really didn't know how they got from point A to point B. Um, sea turtles are spending you know, over 90% of their lives actually underwater. So once again, it's really difficult to study uh, these animals. And so we're missing a lot of behaviors such as feeding, <laughs> feeding um, migrating, and doing whatever else sea turtles are doing when no one is watching what's going on. So that's where satellite tracking comes in, right? So we attach a satellite transmitter to the shell uh, or to the back a carapace of a sea turtle. Every time she comes up to breathe air, that transmitter breaks the surface of the air. Um, I have an example of a transmitter here. Uh, we have a batch that just came in. And this is what's glued on to the shell. And then this antenna has to break the surface of the water. And when that antenna breaks the surface of the water, it sends out a signal and basically with its ID number. That's picked up by a satellite that's orbiting the Earth and then relayed to a ground station and basically it emailed um, to me every day. So I get an email of all the locations of all the turtles that we're tracking uh, each morning and I, uh, so that I can then plot those on maps. Now satellite tracking is not a new thing. Uh, the first satellite tracking actually was uh, done with elks and polar bears in the uh, early to mid 70s. 
And then loggerhead, the first sea turtle was tracked in 1979. This was a rehabilitated loggerhead. Uh, it was actually, uh, it's hard to see, but it's a tether. So it was attached to the back of the shell and it was dragged behind the turtle. Uh, that's not as common these days, but they still use it. Um, now we glue them directly to the shell. So why do we conduct satellite tracking? What's the purpose of it? Some of that I've mentioned, we wanna look at their movements um, they're in the water because we don't see them, it's hard to see them. We can identify foraging areas. So we can identify once they leave that nesting beach, where are they going to find food? Uh, we can associate behavior with different things. Uh, the satellite data, tracking data allows us to sort of infer or try to determine what kind of behavior they're having. Like feeding behavior is very different from a long distance migration behavior. And I can show you some examples of that. We pri primarily started out doing it as an educational project, sharing the maps and the migrations of these turtles as part of an online education program. Uh, but also the research and the information we're learning can be applied for conservation to help protect sea turtles. Um, I'm gonna sort of talk a little bit about migration and movements. So if you think about birds, you know, often they will uh, have a summer nesting place and then they migrate for the winter to the south. That's a long distance migration. Uh, there are also short distance migrations. So an animal that's moving maybe between two areas that they find food, right? Uh, there's also what's called a home range. And this is an area that they tend to stay in to find food, find shelter, and, and it's very kind of restricted, right? Sea turtles have a very broad sort of definition of home range because of these long distance migrations, right? So they have a nesting beach that they're associated with. They have this migration corridor or path between that nesting beach and then wherever they're feeding. And what we tend to see is that there's this really core small area where they're spending most of their time on the feeding ground, but they'll wander out and wander around looking for other uh, sources of food as well. And that's generally for all species, but there are exceptions to that. Oh, so yeah, yeah, nesting beach represented by the umbrella, feeding area represented by the pizza. So back in 2008, <clears throat> we started this uh, pro educational program called the Tour de Turtles. And it was an expansion of what we started back in 1996 is just sharing the tracks of turtles. The Tour de Turtles is um, basically like a race, a marathon between the turtles, and it's to see which turtle will go the furthest distance after three months. So we have a, a leaderboard and you can see uh, these are all of our hard shelled turtles that uh, didn't include the leatherbacks in this one. Uh, but this turtle Bion on the far left, loggerhead uh, is the one that went the furthest distance in those three months. And so that becomes the winner. Uh, each of the turtles is associated with a threat uh, they're trying to raise awareness about. And it's, it, was, uh, it seems to be a still a very successful educational program and we're on year 13 at this point, I believe. Um, so uh, the Torta Turtles locations uh, from Archicar National Wildlife Refuge, but there are also other places throughout the Caribbean, our sites in Costa Rica and Panama, as well as uh, Cuba and then St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, the Archicar Wildlife Refuge, uh, sort of zoom in a little bit more there, uh, it's between Melbourne Beach and Vero Beach on the central east coast of Florida. Uh, it is the highest density of loggerhead nesting in the world, uh, so it is one of the most important nesting beaches for loggerheads um, anywhere in the world, not just here in Florida. So these are some of the girls that we have uh, satellite tagged, um, showing different methods. We generally will uh, capture the turtle in the uh, early morning hours, uh, hold it until light. It makes it a lot easier to do the attachment and then we'll release them uh, in a public way as well so that people can come. You can see people's legs in the background there. Can come and see and watch the turtle uh, leave the beach with her transmitter. Uh, we've satellite tagged uh, 50 different turtles between ourselves and the University of Central Florida. As part of this tour to turtles, uh, a variety of names. Uh, we start out with just two each year and we're up to about, we do about four from two different locations in the refuge. Uh, and this year we'll probably end up doing a bit more because of travel restrictions in other places. So there are two different ways that we attach the transmitter. Uh, the top image, the top left, you see there's a bunch of hands sticking in there with paint brushes. 
those are applying fiberglass uh, strips and a resin, kind of like what you do to fix a surfboard or a boat, a canoe. And so it just lays these fiberglass strips on and it adheres to the shell very well. And the one on the top right, uh, that loggerhead's got that attachment. You can sort of, you can clearly still see the transmitter and it just looks like sort of a, a wet spot on the back of the turtle. Um, that sort of has shifted to this epoxy and that's the picture down on the left and that's a, that gray material you see. It's a two-part concrete epoxy. Uh, the, the right hand, bottom right hand uh, picture, you can see the, it's just a caulking gun with the epoxy that's put on. It's self-mixing. The most important thing about these attachment methods is that they're really low heat, right? So generally when you have a reaction that causes these things to bind, it can generate a lot of heat. We specifically look for products that were very low heat so that it wouldn't hurt the turtle. Generally the process takes about two to two and a half hours for everything uh, to dry and be cleaned. And actually most of the time is actually spent cleaning the shell because those shells are generally covered in all kinds of stuff, especially on loggerheads. So where are the turtles from the Archicar Refuge going? Well, this map, that black dot is the Archicar Refuge and you just see all these lines of spaghetti. So they're going a couple different places, uh, but how they get there can be very different. So if you look, there's a, a line, a lot of them that go north and they're going up to Delaware, uh, Virginia, even off the coast of Maryland. And uh, this is called the Mid-Atlantic region, right? There's some that don't go that far and just stay in the Southeast. Um, and there are others that will stay actually just right off the coast of the Archicar Refuge and go up to Cape Canaveral, uh, where you know the rockets launch. Uh, quite a few will go to the Bahamas, uh, though they don't necessarily take a straight path there. And if you look at those lines all sort of coming off on the right, these are all turtles trying to get to the Bahamas. And if you know anything about the currents here, this is the Gulf Stream, right? The Gulf Stream goes right along the coast of Florida. So these turtles are trying to get from the Archicar Refuge straight east into um, Bermuda, but they get caught in that current and are brought and sort of um, pushed northward while they're trying to get to the Bahamas. Uh, they also will go into the Gulf of Mexico um, on the western shelf, so off the Gulf Coast and even off the, off the coast of um, Mexico as well. Generally, the average speed is about 19.5 um, miles per day, uh, but the fastest ones are going 40 miles per day, right? So that's miles per day, not miles per hour, but miles per day. And the distances, you know, like I said, some of them stay close, 19 miles um, from the nesting beach. But then we had one that went over 2,000 miles from the nesting beach, and that's that one that went to Mexico. And um, so that's like driving from Orlando all the way to Denver, Colorado. Right? So a pretty incredible distance for these turtles to follow. So what are they doing there? Sort of what are these behaviors that we're seeing? Once again, those umbrellas represent the nesting beach. The most common thing that we see is that they just leave the nesting beach and they go to one primary main feeding area. Okay, and that's all they do and they move back and forth between the nesting beach and that feeding area. The other thing we've seen occasionally, not as often, is they'll go to a primary feeding area, a first stop feeding area represented by that pizza, but then they leave that after about 90 days and they go to a secondary area and they stay there. So it's these two different feeding areas that they use, um, but they often will stay at that secondary one. Now there's another one that is based on temperature. So the turtles that are heading north and going off the coast of Maryland and stuff, that water in the winter months gets too cold for them. And so they head south and go down to the coast of the Carolinas or even all the way back close to Florida. But then once the water warms up, they go back up north, back to that primary feeding area. And so they move back and forth between these two different feeding areas based on water temperature. So this one is different from that secondary because they're moving back and forth between the two areas. And then occasionally we'll have one that from that primary area will actually do loops. So they'll just cruise out to another area, find food, stay there for a couple days and then loop back. And they often will go to different areas when they do those loops. So there's all these different behaviors that we're learning about because we're able to satellite track them rather than just saying, okay, well they leave, they're feeding their uh, nesting beach and they go to some place to feed. 
So we've been finding some really interesting information. So here I'll give you some examples of these paths. So this is Pearl and she did that basic standard migration. You know, it was 500 miles, 26 days, and she ended up in a feeding area on the Gulf Coast of Florida. And we tracked her there for over, you know, I think it ended up being close to 300 days until the transmitter uh, stopped working. Nice and simple, straightforward, easy to talk about. Then you get uh, Bella Brevard, and she was one of the first turtles that we did in 2008. So her first migration was 31 days and 840 miles. All right, so I'm just drawing on the screen again. She then ended up in a uh, summer area uh, for 30 days, and then it got too cold, so then she moved, uh, she migrated south off the coast of North Carolina. Once the weather got warm enough, she went back to that same summer foraging area. And the only reason that we know all this is because we tracked this turtle for nearly four years, and so we got a lot of good information from her. And we she just kept moving. What? Sorry, we had a few questions. Okay, that's fine. Um, one was, how do you put the tags on the shell without damaging the turtle shell? So does the epoxy damage the turtle shell when it comes off? Um, no, it, it, it doesn't. So the idea is that um, the sea turtles, their shell has um, over the bone, a layer of what are called scoops. And it's made out of the same material as your <laughs> toenails. And as the turtle grows, those scoots come off, you know, so it's just like as our toenail, our fingernails and grow, we have to clip them. Well, naturally on the sea turtles, those, shell, those pieces of uh, scoot will come off. So as the pieces of scoot that the transmitter is attached to come off, then the transmitter eventually falls off. If we get it, find a turtle on the beach again that has a transmitter, we can then remove it because there's a layer between the transmitter and the shell that we can cut through without uh, harming the turtle at all. But yes, if the transmitter comes off, it will take that outer layer of scoot with it, but that's only because there's a fresh new layer of scoot that's protecting the shell underneath it. So it's not like if it comes off, it's pulling all the skin or the shell off the turtle. Um, it's, um, they do knock them off and we have recovered them. Uh, with that outer layer of scoot on them, but it's uh, it ultimately it doesn't harm the turtle. Loggerheads probably just think of it as a really large barnacle because they're often covered with barnacles. Uh, so um, we've also changed the shape and the size of the transmitters so that it reduces the amount of drag that it causes. So everything we've done over the last few years is we try to improve the transmitters, try to reduce the impact on the turtle. So, but that is a good that's a good question. Um, we also had, can you visit that refugee, uh, the wildlife refuge you mentioned? Yeah, so the Archicar Wildlife Refuge, it's kind of unique in that it has a north border and a south border, but there are also private houses within the boundaries of the refuge. Uh, there are also a lot of county parks in Brevard and Indian River County that are within the refuge. So Sebastian Inlet State Park um, is a good place to visit. Um, there's the Barrier Island uh, Ecosystem Center just north of the inlet. Uh, you can access the beach there at Bond Steel. So there are a lot of county parks where you can go and visit. And they have a really busy year this year from what I've heard. So if you want to see tracks and you're close enough, um, it's, a, it's a really cool place to, to check out uh, during the day to see those tracks. Perfect. And finally, was there a specific cause for that uh, decline of the loggerheads in 2000? Um, that's a great question because there was a lot of discussion about that. Um, when it first started happening, uh, there was a lot of concern because the trend was very positive. Um, there's, the interesting thing was that in that same period when the loggerheads were declining, green turtle nesting and leatherback nesting on that same beach was still increasing. So it wasn't something to do with the beach. So the, our best guess is that it was either a natural cycle, but more likely there was some heavy impact, most likely due to uh, bycatch in fisheries. So um, fisheries uh, accidentally catching sea turtles is a pretty big issue. And there have been a lot of things recently to address that. And that might be what we're seeing the increase now is that a lot of policies and things have been put in place to try to protect um, loggerheads specifically. 
And that was initially an idea of why that would decline was happening. But we honestly, we don't really know. It's very difficult to determine. Um, Awesome. Thank you. All right. All right. So, uh, Belle, uh, so she continued. I'm going to go through this quickly. She kept going back and forth until finally in um, 2011, she actually came back to the refuge to nest. So that's three years after that. Uh, she came back, nested in the same area, and then she then had her uh, migration back to that same summer feeding area. Now, the interesting thing to see on this is how close she stays to the coast, right? It'd be a much more direct line if you just did a straight line from that nesting beach to um, off the coast of North Carolina and then up to that area. But once again, she would hit that Gulf Stream and while it might help her move north, it'd also take her too far east. So they tend to stay in that shallower water, the continental shelf, and they really hug the coast. And that's become an important area to be protected as well as, as a marine uh, conservation area. Uh, this is an example of that looping behavior. So she does a, no a normal migration to that foraging area and then she does this loop. And um, it was over about uh, 33 days and she came right back into that same area. And so this is how we were sort of identifying those different behaviors. Thank you. Um, Lady Marmalade was kind of a, a crazy turtle. She did really bizarre things and sort of doesn't fit into any other category. Um, she actually stayed off the nesting beach feeding there. Um, she then migrated south to the Keys, uh, was there, but then came back. So she did this loop back up, most likely because she got caught in that Gulf Stream again and the currents took her north. And then she ended up back in the Keys and then she did this crazy thing. I don't know if she was trying to write her name or trying to draw something, um, these big loops. And then she ended up um, off the coast of Mexico. And this is where we thought she was gonna stay and, and finish foraging. But then she just wandered off um, over the next 49 days until the transmitter stopped. So we ultimately don't know where she ended up, unfortunately. So why do they pick where they go? Why do some turtles go north? Why do some turtles go to the Bahamas or into the Gulf of Mexico? So we had a couple of different ideas. Maybe it was size. Um, it tended to be that the bigger turtles um, were going to the Bahamas. Maybe they needed that larger size to fight those currents. Um, but that didn't really explain uh, all the different locations. Um, there was another idea that as hatchlings, uh, they had actually been there before. Uh, so as hatchlings go off of our beaches in Florida, they go out to that Gulf Stream and they're drifting um, for 10 to 14 years and they're circling the Atlantic Ocean. And so maybe they've encountered these areas before. Um, the problem with that is that it doesn't really count for why loggerheads from the east coast of Florida would go into the Gulf of Mexico. It's really unlikely that as a hatchling they would be there. Um, and there also seems to be a timing. So turtles that um, arrived early to nest, like arriving now to nest and left the nesting beach early. Uh, uh, and, um, and then the turtles that left later in the season tended to stay a little bit closer. So there actually seems to be a couple different populations of turtles based on where they feed and where they're finding their feed. They're finding their food. And ultimately, why is this important? Yeah, it's great for education, raise awareness, but satellite tracking can actually help address some of these conflicts between uh, sea turtles and humans, these interactions that are negative for them. So uh, bycatch for loggerheads on longline fishery, this is all, these all are images of loggerheads that are on longline hooks. And what we were finding in, um, here actually in Florida is that there was a longline industry on the Gulf Coast uh, off the Gulf Coast of Florida, that was really catching a lot more loggerheads and turtles than it should be or that was anticipated. And what we realized based on the satellite tracking with just not our organization but others as well, was that there's this really big overlap that circular areas where the fishery was occurring and then all those lines or tracks of turtles, there was a heavy overlap between the fishery and the turtles. And what ended up happening is that they actually moved that fishery to a different time of year and they moved it west 
into deeper water so that the overlap was less. And so it's really cool to think about that the research being done to learn about turtles is actually also directly benefiting and help protecting the turtles because of that conservation impacts. So um, I'm done so I've talking about loggerheads, but I mentioned earlier the Tour de Turtles. Uh, we are actually doing a leatherback Tour de Turtles race that starts next week. And this is in cooperation with Florida Leatherback Inc. down in Palm Beach County. And they were very kind enough to help us out and uh, satellite tag uh, five uh, leatherbacks uh, for oh. us, plus add in one of the turtles that they've been tracking this year. And this, once again, is this idea of this marathon. And on June 16th, we start counting the distance that they go. And the turtle that swims the furthest distance in about three months will be uh, the winner of the leatherback Tour de Turtles this year. And then we're also going to do a loggerhead one that starts in August. But we figured we had this great opportunity for these Florida leatherbacks to highlight them this year. So thank you very much. And um, it looks like we have um, plenty of time to answer any questions people may have. Yeah, we do have a few in the chat. Um, let's see. I was starting to answer, if the transmitter falls off, can you still identify the turtle um, through the microchip if it ends up on shore? And would you tag it again to continue recording data? So yeah, and that's why we do those tags, um, both those flipper tags and the pit tags. And um, if the turtle was healthy and if there was a, a good reason to track her again, then yes, we would. Uh, it's, if you get the opportunity to track a turtle multiple times, it just emphasizes that they are going back to those same areas. Um, so it adds additional information, but it's also nice to get new individuals. So if like the, tr the transmitter had been on for four years, I probably wouldn't tag that turtle again, just because we wouldn't want to do that to her again. Um, but um, yeah, so we can still identify that turtle through flipper tags or the pit tags, yep. And why are loggerheads called loggerheads? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, so loggerheads get their name because they're really big skull, really uh, powerful jaws because of what they eat, which are primarily crustaceans, things like lobsters and clams and uh, scallops and oysters and hard crabs, uh, things like that. So they have really powerful jaws and so they have a really big head, loggerhead. And um, what are the common predators for the loggerhead? So as um, hatchlings, anything like raccoons uh, can dig up nests, uh, seabirds, things like night, night herons can grab hatchlings. And once they hit the water, large predator fish, um, a dolphin fish, certainly sharks, tarpon, things like that. Once they get to a good size, like um, a juvenile uh, size, then really it's, it's sharks that can get them. But as full grown adults, a shark may be able to take a fin or part of a flipper or something like that. But pretty much as full-grown adults, it's humans. We're, we're the biggest, well, not necessarily predator, but threat to them as an adult. And let's see. Yeah. Oh, uh, do the tags affect how the turtle swims? Um, that's a really good question. In general, uh, they've become more hydrodynamic. Uh, so they, they reduce that impact and they become smaller. And some of the techniques we actually use for leatherbacks changed because the old techniques were causing uh, uh, the turtles a harder time to swim. So um, yeah, it does have a very minor impact on them, but it's, uh, it's been reduced greatly over the years. It started, the first transmitters we put out pretty much looked like a brick. So they've definitely improved over the years. Very cool. Uh, which turtle is the largest in size? So leatherback sea turtles are the largest sea turtle species and pretty much the largest reptile except for maybe the Komodo dragon, if you include the tail. Very good. Um, um, I never thought about the Komodo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the greatest number of days a tag has lasted, we've tracked a turtle for five years, which is the longest we've had. Oh, and I missed one. Um, if the turtle loses a fin, can it still swim? Uh, yeah, can you give me one second? I'm sorry, hold on. Oh, of course. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. Can, I could probably. Can you right what's the greatest number of days a tag lasted? How do you put the tag on the turtle? So he did show us. Um, we did record this as well, so we'll post it on YouTube if you missed part of the presentation. Um, but 
he showed us that there are two main ways to mount it. Um, both of them are really just gluing it to the shell in some way, shape, or form. Um, there was uh, gluing it with a fiberglass sort of uh, structure where you have these sheets of fiberglass and you glue it down, um, but that is starting to become out of fashion and now you use a special epoxy he showed us. Sorry about that. I'm the only one in the office and there was a big delivery. It'll <laughs> <laughs> be fine. Um, yeah, so fiberglass. Uh, I think actually the fiberglass actually attaches better, um, but it takes a little bit longer and you have to do it. It's easier to do in daylight, so it makes it a little bit trickier. So. Um, the brand that lasted. So uh, that was a Sirtrack, what's called a Sirtrack unit. So there's about three different companies that consistently uh, create uh, wildlife tags for sea turtles and sharks. I see somebody had mentioned in the chat about sharks. Yeah, they, they, they drill it through the dorsal fin. Um, and there are some methods for leatherbacks that include, you know, doing something similar to that. Um, but yeah, so Surtrack, which is a New Zealand company, it was that, and it was the fiberglass attachment method on a, a hawksbill. And the nice thing about hawksbills is that their shells, sort of their scoots overlap rather than being smooth completely. And so it made a really nice surface to grab onto. So it was, uh, I think that was part of it too. Um, let's see. Um, I go, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards to the, yeah, the tag. Uh, turtles cannot regulate their body temperature and prefer warmer climates. Yes, exactly. And that's why there's, there's movements when the water gets too cold for them being cold blooded, uh, relying on the external temperatures. Uh, all the species except for leatherbacks really have to pay attention to that. that. Uh, <laughs> now the, the leatherbacks tend to be able to tolerate much colder water. Um, yeah, so we've actually seen um, loggerheads come up missing parts of their fin. Uh, generally, um, like if a turtle is injured and they have to bring it into a rehabilitation center and they have to remove a fin, I think for the most part they tend to keep them in captivity um, and maybe not on a back fin, um, but those front flippers are all their power strokes and so that's a tricky thing, but we've seen turtles come up missing parts of their rear flippers. Um, we've seen a, a loggerhead try to come up and nest missing almost entirely both of her back flippers. Uh, and in that case, the people who encountered her actually tried to dig her egg chamber for her, um, which I, no, she still didn't end up nesting, unfortunately. But yeah, they can have some pretty, pretty serious injuries that they can survive. They're tough animals. They're pretty tough animals. Um, are, tur are all turtles shy? Yeah, I mean, like if you're in the water with them and they're swimming around, they're definitely curious about uh, us, I think, as much as we are about them. Um, and they may come up to you. Um, they're generally not aggressive. Uh, the only time that we've really had issues with uh, turtles sort of trying to bite us is when you, when you catch them in the water and you take them up onto a boat. You know, they're not used to that. They're not expecting it. The females that nest, um, you know, anything with a mouth can bite and a loggerhead bite can be pretty, pretty serious if they really get a good hold of you. Because think about it, they're crushing clamshells. So um, they can do some serious damage to a, a human hand. So just stay away from the head. That's always a good thing. Uh, but yeah, no, on the nesting beach, they're pretty mellow as well. So. I don't know if there were some other Questions? Uh, okay. All right. Yeah, I think you hit most of them. Um, <laughs> if anyone has any more questions, we'll hang out for a little bit more. Oh, Ashley raised her hand. Oh, okay. I don't know if she, that was intentional, but if you no, no, did you just <laughs> unmute yourself. <laughs> um, otherwise, uh, we will be, we recorded this. Um, we'll try to post it on YouTube. Um, we have, do you often switch their trackers? I guess that'll be our last question. Otherwise you can always email the meek and if we can't answer it, we'll pass it on to Dan. Yep. Um, um, so yeah, if we can recover a satellite transmitter, um, 
So a satellite transmitter costs anywhere from a thousand to five thousand dollars, depending on all the features you have on it. So we can do a lot more. Like the ones we get are just looking at latitude and longitude, so location, like a GPS unit. If we can get those back, um, we can get a new battery put in them for about half the price. So yeah, if we can get a, a transmitter back, that we always try to do that. Um, and then if it's a turtle that maybe had an interesting track or we're wondering if they're gonna go back to the same place, then yeah, we'd put a new transmitter on them. That really hasn't happened for us that often. Uh, there's been a few cases. Uh, probably um, for loggerheads, we're seeing pretty consistent patterns. It'd be really interesting to satellite track a leatherback multiple seasons because the, often the transmitter doesn't stay on as long and they're doing very different things. And so I haven't seen many tracks of leatherbacks that have the same turtle tracked uh, multiple nesting seasons. Um, and that would be kind of really interesting to see. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I, I think that was our last question. Um, I do want to say thank you everyone for joining and thank you so, so much, Daniel, for coming in and doing this presentation. Um, we do have another one this week on Thursday. Um, we are talking with Stacy Gallagher about turtles and lighting, which I'm sure that you know is a huge issue. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today.